Good afternoon, everyone. I think I see a lot of great uh, readers and lots of friends of Books and Books and my Ambu Book Fair here on um, on our virtual virtual afternoon with Helen McDonald and Drew uh, Lanham. I'm so glad to see you all. I'm Lisette Mendez. I'm the program director for the Miami Book Fair. And on behalf of our whole entire staff at Miami Day College and also uh, the very hardworking staff at our independent bookseller, Books and Books, um, we're so glad you were able to come this afternoon uh, and participate in this uh, in this great event. Um, please remember to leave your questions in the ask a question box. It's right under here. Um, and if you have any comments, uh, you know, for Drew and for Helen, um, again, the ask a question box is the best way uh, to get to get them to them. I'm going to be bringing them up on stage in just a few minutes. And then um, I will come back when it's time for the Q&A to make sure that uh, we're not missing any of your insightful questions. Um, I do have to say that um, Helen is going to have a little bit of a surprise for us um, uh, in sometime during this event. So stay tuned all the way uh, to the end and you will get a very fun treat that no one else is getting on the tour. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Helen McDonald, though I know that you guys all know how incredible she is, but um, she is a writer and poet, an illustrator and a naturalist, and has been hailed as one of our century's most important and insightful nature writers. A research scholar at the University of Cambridge and a New York Times Magazine writer, among many other accomplishments, she's the author of the best-selling H is for Hawk. She's also the author of A Cultural History of Falcons, titled Falcon, and three collections of poetry. Her newest, which we're, um, we'll be talking about today with uh, Drew, is Best for Flight. Um, and um, her discussion is surely to be uh, particularly interesting because she is joined by J. Drew Lanham, the author of the award-winning The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature. He's a birder, a naturalist, and a hunter-conservationist who has widely published essays and poetry. He's a professor at Clemson University, and he comes to us today from South Carolina. Uh, give us just a few seconds, and I am bringing our guests up on stage. Hello. Hello, Drew. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, unseasonably warm here, which is worrying, of course, these days. But um, I've just shed my jacket and I'm sweating slightly, but I'm very well. I hope you're well. It's good to see you. It's, um, I guess we were last together in Vermont last uh, June, right? I was, it just... Time has done some very strange things, hasn't it? It seems like about at least a thousand years ago that we hung out and this is the woodcock flying over at night, pouring in the starlit <laughs> sky. Yeah, it was an amazing time. It was great to, great to meet and talk with you. It was such a pleasure. Well, it, it's, um, yes, time has just slipped by, but at the same time, I, you know, there are days when we wish for that simplicity, I guess. Um, in hindsight, 2020 has certainly not been any sort of year of perfect vision. Oh, it's it's horrendous. Um, yesterday, I watched a video. Um, I'm, I have been. I think the term is doom scrolling on Twitter. Um, <laughs> it's just perpetual horror. I mean, I saw a video of a, a fire tornado, um, in, you know, on the west coast, and I actually found myself saying no, 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 in precisely mm -hmm. the um, that I use when my father died. This sense that you know, um, there's no, there's no kind of linguistic response to that. That you know, and and trying to keep hold of hope in in this scenario we have right now is, it's a huge battle, you know. And I think it's something that um, we're all finding it hard to, to struggle to keep to keep keep you know hold of it. But I guess it's you know it's essential. So. Yeah, I you know I I tell my 
kind of friends that, I mean, it's a morbidly target rich environment now um, for writers, um, for any writer. Um, and this is a huge nature story, right? COVID is a nature story. That is, um, yeah nature story but the writing is also heavy and um and it's exhausting and so i'm 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 really appreciative we are appreciative as as fans of yours and fans of this earth and wild things and living things and life yeah. for this book helen um it's 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 a wonderful service that you're doing and i don't know um quite how else to put it, but that, that the words that you offer are, are not just inspiring. I mean, it's information. Obviously you've done your homework. I've done <laughs> you, my homework. You've done your homework as a scientist and a noticer. Um, but you're, you're also opening yourself up and, and reply. Drew, I, I, one of, you know, um, in fact, as I can see, there's a question here that I might be, I might be answering already too soon about what, what we've learned from each other in terms of our writing practice. And there was a line in your book, Home Place. By the way, if people are watching this and they haven't got a copy of this book, you should just get one in, immediately. Um, and it's where you say, um, more and more, you take the hard data. That's very English of me saying it like that. You take the hard data, but you wrap it in genuine pairing. And I think that really was a kind of a watch, a top turn for me writing this book, this notion that we need science, we need the hard science, we need the models, we need the theory, we need the field work, we need to work with all those people. But we need also to communicate the love and the quality of the texture of the world at the same time. We, we need to see it all at once. And um, so thanks for that. I think that's one of the themes of the book that I try to get across um, always in writing it. Well, well, you did so beautifully, and I, I, I want you to share some some readings, of course, so people can hear it in in your voice. But I, I you know, I, I kept so my copy here um, that's relatively new. You can't see all of the the pages and the markings, but it's my working copy, and so um, there are things underlined, there are things asterisked there, and if you read all the things that. I had marked for you to read. You'd just be reading the whole book to us, which is I this going to be? Are you going to Are you going to do an audible? Is there? Um, yeah, there is an audible, and um, it was a really interesting experience. It was It was recorded in the middle of very hard lockdown, um, in a tiny studio with a coffee machine and a bicycle, and it was like a shed. And a lovely guy called Andy, and I stood there and well, I sat there in front of this little microphone and. You know, the thing about audiobook recording is that not only do I, I assume this ridiculous Oxford received pronunciation Royal Shakespeare Company accent, but <laughs> every time the number of common words that I've been routinely mispronouncing my entire life and no one yes. <laughs> so shall I read, I'll read a bit about um, maybe releasing a Swift. This is um, from one of the essays. Yes. Um, called Rescue, it's about rescuing animals. And it's about a friend of mine called Judith, who is a, an older lady who lives in a little village near me, who's an expert at rearing swifts, these incredibly aerial birds, one of the ones on the cover, that um, have become a kind of, um, I don't know, they're very important to me for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. So when they're reared, they are incredibly cuddly with each other. They snuggle up against each other in these little boxes and they're constantly feeding each other and kind of arguing and they're very, very affectionate. The thing about baby swifts is once they leave the nest, they start flying and they don't stop flying. They don't touch ground or anything really for about two or three years. So they go from this life of total kind of, I don't know, warm companionship to this totally remote, isolated life. And it just blows my mind. So I had the opportunity to actually release one. I'll stop talking in a second about that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what it's to release a baby swift uh, for the first time into the air. So you put it in your hand and you hold it up into the wind. It stares into the wind for a while, then it starts shivering. Anticipation, I think. Functional explanation. This bird is warming up its pectoral muscles ready for flight. Emotional explanations. Anticipation, wonder, joy, terror. The sensitive phyllo plumes growing between the feathers of its wings and sleek sides are being brushed by the breeze, feeling their element, 
for the first time. Nothing has visibly changed. Something is happening, like an aircraft avionic system coming online with it powers up, looking like engine set. But that doesn't work, though, not quite as an analogy, because what I am watching is a new thing making itself out of something else. There is no doubt in my mind that this is as much a transformation as a dragonfly larva crawling from water and tearing itself out into a thing with wings. On my open palm, a creature whose home has been paper towels and plastic boxes is turning into a different creature whose home is thousands of miles of air. Then the swift decides. It tilts the pug-sharp tiny tip of its beak upwards, arches its back, and drops from my flattened palm, making an open series of stiff and creaky wing beats. For five or six seconds, everything feels wrong. The bird is a mere foot above the grass, and my heart is beating fast. Up, 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 calls the unit. Nothing is broken. We are just watching a bird learning to fly. Hitching as if pulling into gear, the swift starts to ascend, flickering up and up into a sky streaked with evening cirrus. It describes one careful circle above our heads, then lifts even higher and straight lines it to the south. I look down at my palm. There's a little scratch on the meat of my thumb where its claws had gripped tight before letting me go. Gripped tight to the hand that was the last solid thing the bird would touch for years. It was very emotional. Uh, you know, Helen, um, I mean, I, I think for, for me, there's so much texture in this book. There's there, there, these rises and these runs, these lifts and falls. There's this whole landscape that you present as a writer here. And, and that is, I mean, that's an extraordinary hopeful piece there and you mentioned hope and, and trying to find it and yeah it's cliched that you know hope is the thing with feathers it, excuse us please Emily Dickinson but yeah. you know I, I think we, we try to we, we're trying to find that now where be, beyond that swift and as a as a nature writer and as an observer how are you keeping your head up these days in the midst of all that is going on? There are a number of ways, and some of them um, are simply from watching the righteous anger of many people who are mobilizing and organizing to try and fix the seemingly unstoppable slide towards total horror. That's good. In terms of hope in my heart, um, they tend to be quite fugitive moments. So quite yeah. recently, I had this moment that completely blew my mind and, and made me feel hopeful for days. And I was driving around some lanes near my house and I saw a, a big SUV parked in the road with a, like a warning light flashing. And it was the kind of SUV that in Britain tends to mean the person driving it is a bit of an asshole. Sorry. <laughs> Here too. So, I know. So I was like, oh, what's this? And I assumed, I'm sorry, I assumed that, um, you know, something had happened and I got out and there was a very stressed looking man in some very expensive clothes and he stopped me and he said, I'm just standing here. I've been standing here for like ages. There's some ducks. And he showed me that on the road there was a puddle and on the puddle there was a female mallard and some half grown duck on it. And they were just sort of paddling around and feeding in this puddle. And I said, why didn't you just put them, push them back into the ditch where the water is? And he said, I didn't want to disturb them. And I said, how long have you been here? And he said, like, you know, I don't know, an hour and a half, two hours. You know, he's just he's been standing there. And every car that went past, he was telling to be careful because of the drugs. And it was that that I think, you know, it's things like that. It's these moments, little moments of redemption and people that are unexpected that carry me through, I think, at the moment. Yeah, it's and beyond assumption, right? You know, yeah. the sometimes the people that we assume are going to be those um, those archetypes <laughs> um, based upon what they're driving or yeah. um, perception and so that's that's one of the things that also came through to me you you craft so beautifully identity into into Vesper in ways both personal, but then you also cross these lines and you talk about national identity, what it means to be British versus English, or these impressions of, of American exceptionalism, which have gotten us into trouble, Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, not being a team player um, in the global scene is not good. 
in, in my left wing opinion. But can you talk a little bit, Helen, about how you you come to write what you write? I, I just the way that you you splice culture and conservation and all of these things together so seamlessly. I mean, how do you do this? Do you just this is a really interesting question. I mean, there's a, the craft question is quite funny because um, I remember, like, I don't write, I think, like I ought. So um, I used to be terrified of the word essay because it reminded me of what happened at school. I was the kind of child who could never do their homework. Um, like you, I was out in the field finding live things, just desperate to find life. And then when I got to university, I was enough to go to university, it got even worse. And, and I realized eventually the problem was that I was told that to write an essay, you had to plan it very carefully before you started writing. You had to do your introduction on a bit of paper and then your, you know, your argument and conclusion. And this stopped me from writing completely. I could do examinations. They were, they were like white water rafting. You just, you know, followed the sentence down on the page. That was easy, but frightening. And I realized that when I wrote, um, I need to see what I'm writing before I know what I'm going to say next. And um, I think that's quite a generous thing in terms of bringing the reader in. So the, the essays often seem to me like puzzles that I'm trying to solve as I write them. And that's what the narrative does. And in terms of the kinds of ways I try to bring in things like class and national identity, because you know we all know this is the terrifying secret about the natural world. It exists, it's a real thing, it's to be honored, it has its own reality. It's, astonishing and alien and, and familiar but we load it with so much of our own cultural and social meanings and it works so well to support those meanings because it's supposed to be free of them so there's a lot of stuff about class in here and a lot of that the way that i work comes from a background in academic uh, as an academic historian of science because these questions really animated me for many years. You know, why do we think some animals and some landscapes mean certain things? And why do we like some animals and not like others? And it, it's nearly always about us. Um, so my, my favorite example, I think, of this is, you know, we think of certain songbird protection laws in America as being to protect songbirds. And if you look at the history, it turns out that they were mainly imposed to stop Italian immigrants trespassing and shooting birds. Right. So it was an anti-immigrant law. That's all been you know, forgotten. And I think that's the kind of thing I want to pull out um, from, from the historical record. Those those connections are are critical. And and I, you know, I'm I don't know, I'm sort of I'm sort of between a rock and a hard place these days because I sit in the backyard um, as we were quarantined and I'm sort of passively catching birds as they're coming through. I'm not out actively searching for birds. Yeah. So many of these birds I'm watching, rose-breasted grosbeaks and all of these neotropical migrants and residents landing in privet and landing in these invasive exotics. Yeah. And ecologically, the birds aren't seeing them like we see them. And so this sort of nativist language that we use, that's very edgy. And all you gotta do is trace back a little bit. And I, I love, you know, there's a, there's a chapter on, on a wild boar. Um, there are chapters you talk about murmurations and starlings. I'm particularly intrigued with starlings because they bring people to tears in murmuration, but then up close people hate them to death, literally, and they're unprotected. Yeah. So do you, how much of a headwind do you meet from fellow ecologists when you sort of give equal footing to the things that they say are supposed to be there and things that they would just as soon see disappear? That's interesting. I, I, I mean, I, I try to be not even handed. I think my, my, my role in, in writing this. So, for example, in a slightly I'm not really answering the exact question about invasive, invasive species, um, things that shouldn't be where we want them to be, which is always a bit, as you say, politically quite often inflected with some very dark things, even if people don't realize what's going on. Um, I think about a bit about cage birds. So um, one of the essays talks about how um, mm. there's a lot of invective and horror of, of people keeping small native British, even captive bred bird species in, in cages. Um, and yet there's almost no invective aimed at very elite people, uh, very rich people who keep British native wildfowl on lakes with bits of their wings cut off so they can't fly away. No. So um, I have been accused in that essay of supporting the cage bird, you know, 
business that I that I, I approve of paid ads. And that's not what I'm doing at all. I'm just saying, look, here is a right. very significant socially marked discrepancy between the way we think about these birds and whether it's okay to keep them. And it's all about class. <laughs> species, I think most of the scientists and ecologists that have read to me generally think that I'm not um, I'm not trying to undermine the reality of the fact that some things like kudzu and Japanese not really are disastrous um, when introduced. But just to point out that, for example, you know, the English Sparrow Wars, back in, you know, Elliot, Elliot Cowes and, and, and all those kind of, um, the kind of invective and hatred, I mean, those sort of, their birds were, even in Australia, you know, if you read sort of Australian government websites about invasive species like sparrows, you know, they're described as promiscuous. They're terrible birds, they're promiscuous, they don't, they don't care for life. And it's like, this isn't really important. <laughs> like, this is something well, else. Slut, slut, slut shaming a passerine. Slut shaming know? passerine. Well, I mean, they kind of deserve it in some ways. They are tend to be a little bit <laughs> But no, I'm joking. I mean, so much, you know, it's it's that it's that way that you can read virulent anti-immigrant sentiment when it's when it's when it's just when it's aimed at birds. You know, you're not supposed to see it. And there it is. It's it's plain as day. So it's fascinating and very troubling to see this thing, this, you know, how, how revealing these these thoughts are. It it and again, it um for me and and I don't know, sometime Helen, when we have have an opportunity, I I, I think I talk to my students a lot about some of the language that was coming out of pre-World War II Germany from the zoologists there and some of the restoration of the great forests of Western, of Eastern Europe. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's a little shocking how close the language is. And so I think as writers, certainly, and you're a lover of words. I, you know, People. it's- Hello. Hello. Was that just a random? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a free for all now. But I, you know, it, it's you create these. You create such relief with your words. And you know that question about structure and and sort of of, of where you're led. I tend to be rather structureless in part because I wasn't trained as a writer, and so that that frees me up in some ways that it seems to have freed you up. You, you don't seem to be caught up in any sort of tradition but your own. And so, wow. I, you know, I don't know. It, it's, um, it's hard. And to it's, me. You, 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 know, you know what it's like when you, when you want to write about nature, because, you know, in your head, I'm sure you also have that, that tone that from the nature books when you were small, it was that authoritative. Yes. You know, it was uh, it was a guy. It was always a white guy. It was always a white guy who, who could go anywhere he wanted and see whatever he wanted, and pretty much owned everything. And the tone of those books is very beguiling. And but there's always a bit of it that makes me think that the person involved is telling you, "Aren't you lucky to have me to explain this to you?" And I, I, I always felt, you know, the draw of that voice. You know, and I did a documentary for the BBC last year, and I, I had to stop. Be stopped quite often because. You know, the director would say, "You're doing a David Attenborough. Stop it!" You know, I do. <laughs> so I try not to do that. So, I mean, I, I think it's, there's so many things just to, to the, you know, one of my watch, my watch words, I think is 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 to be honest. You know, um, you know, if I go out and I don't, I'm bored or I'm rained upon or I don't know what I'm looking at or I'm kind of fed up and I'm thinking about a washing machine rather than the mountainside, that's what I want to put in. You know, and um, the writer David. Lesnar was very helpful. He wrote a wonderful book called Sick of Nature, where he talks mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. that um, that kind of high church type of tone that a lot of nature writing has, that somehow it's morally uh, a position to occupy if you know nature, you're better than other people. And we're all just struggling to, to you know, to make connections. And I hope my book just shows you can make connections with creatures that aren't human. We, we, we're living in a world with a devastating lack of empathy and I think that um, trying to imagine what it's like to be an animal or what an animal needs in its world or how it sees the world differently exercises that muscle and it, it, it um, decenters our egos and our sense of ourselves as being the important ones on earth. And I think that's really important. It is, and it, it does. You do that beautifully. I, um, I, I think, you know, as we're trained to, to not anthropomorphize, right? And, um, 
and I've, I've sort of come full circle on that and not sort of bringing animals down to a human level, but certainly for us to, to at least to begin to try to blur the lines. You write so precisely, but you also do this really wonderful job of of blurring some lines and creating stories in between lines, Helen. And um, it's, 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 it's a masterpiece on the ceiling that we can see from afar. Um, but then, we, well, we get there to look closely yeah. and we see these brush strokes, you know, as you describe these as you describe bacteria in the Atacama Desert, or you describe life in a hide as people are going sort of back and forth to, to envision things. But then there's, there, there are these moments of humor. You're a very funny person, but then it's humor that rolls into horror. Yeah. So, you know, going from your descriptions um, and dispatches from the valley, that was, yeah a wonderful opportunity there that we get to see you get to see you in this post-college light or dimness can you talk about that a little bit yeah that was a really interesting essay to write because it started off being funny and um, that's a kiss of the classic or like you know that i say that starts off being one thing and ends up being something about something completely different and it, it had its own logic and in order to write that i had to just listen to what the words were telling me to write next it was almost like a kind of automatic writing so it starts off by <laughs> writing this idiot you know woman in her early 20s who wants to live a real life and she goes to live uh, work in a, a conservation falcon breeding center in rural wales and lives this life it's like part of a 19th century kind of you know it was real rough you know we we didn't have a great housing um and we work seven days a week we we're all slightly mentally challenged mentally health challenged <laughs> and, um and I, uh, there was a, an orchid farm on this on this orchid breeding um place and and, and uh, one day i i was patrolling the fences to check the ostriches and found um a female ostrich had broken her leg catastrophically and it was obvious that she needed to be put out of her misery. She was suffering terribly. And I, I sort of checked my pockets and all I found was a novelty pen knife from a local photographic store, which, you know, wasn't designed to do that sort of job. And I pulled an ostrich with a brick and this pen knife. I mean, it was really bloody and horrifying and gory. And, and, and it, was, it was absolutely necessary. I, I knew I needed to do that. And I think all hunters know that moment when, mm -hmm. yeah. when you know, you have to stop suffering. Um, and then it goes on to this story of how I, I, I basically turned myself into a kind of sniper and I, I stalked this herd of half wild steers on a hillside. I mean, I was pretty nuts. I mean, I honestly, looking back on it, I think I was really suffering some quite serious forms of depression. And, and it ends up being a fable about how animals can teach us lessons um, on how we can still honor the animals but we can use them to think more clearly about where we are in the world. And I think that's something that another essay in the piece of Ephraim does too. But yeah, it was a funny piece. And then suddenly it was like horror. <laughs> yeah. um, it was well, a it, it's, well, you, well, you use the word transformation with the, with the swift and, and sort of this, it making itself into something else and, and it, within your hand. Yeah. And your writing does that. And it's 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 a rarity, really. And I thought about identity. I thought a lot about identity as we talked about earlier, but then I also thought about how how women and non-white males are writing about nature yeah. now, yeah. Um, and coming to recognize where sort of where we are um, in this. So as as you write, um, what what are you what are you reading? along with what you're writing these days? That's really interesting. Um, I'm reading a lot, I'm reading pretty much everything but nature writing when I write. Um, when, I'm, when I'm not writing hard, I'll read all sorts of things. Um, uh, I get a lot of books sent to me as a you know, writer to, to blurb, so um, yeah. I'm out yet. You know, there's everything from books that are about areas of Britain and German novelists living there in the 1970s to, you know, books of poetry or, you know, lots of stuff comes in. It's very varied. Um, when I was writing this, 
Uh, I read a lot of Shakespeare. Uh, I find it really sorts you out in all sorts of ways. It gives you cadences in your head, but at the same time, it reminds mm -hmm. you to be as good as that person. <laughs> 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 And um, what else did I read when I was reading for writing? Yeah, I think um, I think I have. It's interesting. As soon as you, I want to talk about, in terms of lockdown, people keep telling me, you know, Helen, you must be spending all your time outside in the woods, you know, with coping with this. You must be getting solace in the natural world. And you know, part of me gets frustrated because I think to myself that the idea that you know, you can cope with a pandemic by going out on your own in the woods is, is fine. It, absolutely, it works. But what if you live in a, in a crowded inner city with limited financial capital? You can't right. get places. So I, I try and champion small interactions with nature to, to, to do that writing work, the work of writing your head from, from um, horror, really. And you can disappear into a spider as easy as you, if you can at Hillside. But um, a lot of the time I haven't been out writing i mean i'm walking through i've been watching action movies and eating ice cream to cope i want to confess that right now it's not all been communing with the natural world you know i'm just a person yeah. what i want to try and do in the book is all, all those bits of myself not just the bits that go out there with my binoculars but the bits that also you know want to see um you know marvel movies and um, <laughs> yes it, well i mean and that that comes across you're it came across in, in, in H is for Hawk. It comes across here, but I think it's it's important. Again, these sort of larger than life literary figures that, you know, we we come to understand who they are posthumously, usually. Um, and, and now it's a different world. And there's this vulnerability that's that suddenly there that that you share here. Right. Really. And in ways. I mean, just to say, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm butting in. I should shut up. I've just drunk too much coffee. Yeah, but yeah, please. Talking about, you know, um, black voices, people of color, you know, trans voices. I, I, I just, you know, I mean, obviously, my job is to amplify other voices if I can. I mean, I, you know, but uh, uh, I, um, I was thinking the other day about how I read an article about how only recently it's been discovered that, um, you know, for many years we thought that only male birds sang. And it was this <laughs> astonishing, you know, tourism. This is what happens. They still they defend their territory. And it turns out that this is kind of fairly common in the northern hemisphere. But once you get to the tropics, you know, lots and lots of people. All bets are off. All the time. And it turns out that <laughs> most of the work that's done on that was done by women scientists because they yeah. were more open to that as a possibility. And I think, you know, it's a very obvious point that, like, the more voices we have from, from you know, diverse people, the more... You know, nature is a very various thing, and we shouldn't think of it as a monolith. And the practices that take us to it, and the way we interact with it, you know, we should honor the different the, the diversity in that too. Well, it, it comes across here again, and I, um, you know, we have we have many common friends, and you know, and some of those those people were coming out here, and and I think that's sort of this other, not necessarily a new paradigm, but certainly one that you're illuminating, and that's not just again the single white sort of conquering male out there in wildness but but meeting it where it is that this 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 story this anecdote that you paint of this woman feeding these badgers and you sort of waiting there for these animals to appear um all of it is just at, at moments inspiring educational endearing um you know i i like to tell my students that for chickadees cute is a field mark it and really is. <laughs> it's true. You can't, I mean, how do you quantify that, right? Um, but you somehow do. You somehow, you somehow do that. And I think that in part is the lost art of, or maybe you're refining it um, somehow. Maybe it's, is how much of the poet in you comes into your prose a lot a lot yes. and um i i i don't write poetry really anymore i mean i laugh about partly it's because i'm not as heartbroken as regular as i used to be so <laughs> well mainly i think it's because i think i have things to say now and but that part of mm. me um generates you know plays with sound and plays with kind of the ways in which words um you know move across the pages is, is always an operation 
And sometimes it's quite hard to write quite clear auditory stuff because I'm like, oh, I could just make it sound more complicated. It's like, no, Helen, you know, you have to stop that. And it's a bit like how when I was, you know, I, I wanted to be a painter when I was a kid. And, and um, you know, when I look at a, a landscape, um, if I can show you all, probably, this is like my mm -hmm. garden. Sure. You can see I've got a barley field behind there. My bird feeders and a big horse chestnut. Yes. Probably you can see my bins and cigarette butts and terrible things out there. But we'll ignore that. So when I look at a landscape, I, the first thing I do is block in color values. So I think the poetry and also the art thing are, the, are, are two of the yeah. main ways I approach the natural world initially, and then and I go in from there. Well, it, it's it's beautiful, and I I'm talking to you all day, but I know people have questions. Yes. So we could go to some questions for a little bit and then you could do some more reading for us if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, do you want me to read, just read a bit, a little bit now and then we can uh, go to questions? Or do you yeah, want let's, to yeah, let's, um, yes, if you'll read, uh, you know, if you, if you don't mind or if you have something you'd like to read, but I winter sort of sets your landscape, sort of sets your verbal landscape yeah. up for me. Yeah, um, I'll read it from the end of winter which is a it's about how everyone loves woods in summer but uh i have a you know because i'm quite a gothic naturalist i quite like woods in winter too after a light covering of snow the, <laughs> yeah, the prince of woodland mammals and birds can be read to rewind time pheasant tracks end with an imprint of wings each indented primary feather furred with froth recording the moment the bird took off from the ground the previous evening to fly to roost in a Wiltshire wood that seemed utterly devoid of animal life, I once followed the prince in a brown hair right across the snow to a pool of dark water, saw the place where it drank, and from the spacing of the prince of each padded foot, saw how fast or slow it had travelled on its way. So often we think of mindfulness, of existing purely in the present moment as a spiritual goal. But winter woods teach me something else, the importance of thinking about history. They are able to show you the last five hours, the last five days, the last five centuries all at once. Their wood and soil and rotting leaves, the crystal fur of hoarfrost and the melting of overnight snow. Mm. But they're also places of different interpolated time frames. In them, potentiality crackles in the winter air. Uh, I like you know, the I love it. I bemoan the loss, the American loss of some British words, hoarfrost. I, I just bemoan what that. Is it, loss. is it rhyme in America? What do you call it? Well, it's it's really just frost. Frost, okay. I guess it's really <laughs> common here, so you know, we have to give it a different name because it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> thank you, Helen. That was quite so beautiful. Good. So beautiful, Helen. And thank you, Drew, for those incredible incredibly insightful questions. Oh. I'm going to um, go ahead and start uh, some of the questions that we've gotten while we were, uh, while the conversation was going on. And um, uh, we have some from, actually I'm gonna start with a teacher. Um, we have a teacher who is, uh, who teaches environmental science and botany, zoology, um, here, right here in Miami, where I am, not where you are. Um, and uh, they would, uh, this teacher, her name is Amy, she would like to know what segments from each of your books you would want high schoolers to read. Ooh. We could do each other's. No, we should do our own. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I, I think for mine, sorry, I, just, I, I think for mine it would be the title essay, Vespa Flight. Um, for one particular reason, I think it communicates the astonishing alien beauty of these, these birds, these swifts. But also, it talks about how every dusk and dawn they make these ascents up thousands of feet to a point that's so high that they can um, they can feel the weather, the wind from weather systems coming towards them, and they can see hundreds of miles to see clouds on the horizon and where they're going to go, and they can look up and see the stars, and they can use polarized light to calibrate their magnetic compasses. They can work out exactly where they are, and then they look at each other, and they follow each other, and it's like a collaborative act of community to know where they're going to go next. It's a, it's a kind of weather forecast, a forecast of what to do, and I just think it's a fable about human communities and how we need experts and we need to look 
we need to drag ourselves away from everyday life and see where we go. So it's, a, it's, a, it's really about trouble on the horizon. And I hope that that would be a useful thing and um, a really interesting thing, I hope, for high schools to read. Drew. Well, for, well, Helen, first, I imagined those those weird, weird radio transmissions that you were getting were bouncing off of Vesper flights that right. somehow um, I, but you know, for me, I think it's probably, um, I mean, I call myself a cultural ornithologist and I think that probably comes across best in birding while black because, um, especially now yeah. in the time of, um, of this identity crisis that we're having as a country and sort of treating all people equally. So I would, I would love for students to understand the prisms through which we see, and Helen described the science now that's telling us that female birds in the Southern Hemisphere sing, um, and, but that we only know that because scientists who had the ability to look through a different prism um, were, were making the observation. So I think it's important now for students to understand that while we may all love birds or wildness, that our range maps are different, that humans have range maps that are determined by other human behaviors, um, fortunately and unfortunately. So that would be what I would put forward so that people understand um, sort of, of that difference and the importance of recognizing difference just as you do in different birds. That, that essay I sent to so many people, it's, it's so important, um, yeah. Really, really sorry to butt in again. I'm just waving my arms and yelling about how good it is. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's all good, Helen. That's what we do. Um, so we have um, a question for Helen. Uh, and this question is from Laura Joy Tubbard. When you set out to write Best for Flight, what did you feel an essay collection could do that a narrative structure could not? And any comments on the writing process and decisions and an essay collection organization? So all about organi organizing that, that collection and how you came to that particular choice of uh, structure. I'm gonna be very quite a disappointing answer. Um, a, a lot of the pieces um, had their origins um, as pieces that were written for other places. So, um, you know, I wrote, I still write for the astonishing New York Times Magazine, an uh, incredible editor there and a wonderful team. Um, I wrote a lot of those pieces on tour with the book. So a lot of them were written very late at night in hotel rooms while I wept because the deadline was coming. And I joked with my publisher at one point, that, like I could subtitle this book, you know, crying in hotel rooms at 4 a.m. And they were like, no, don't do that. Um, so I rewrote those. The, the essay film I'm beginning to really adore because I think it, 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 it mm -hmm. feels like they are, exercises in concentrated attention um, and they're fashioned of love and wonder. And I think they can do things that longer types of writing, creative nonfiction writing can't. And one of the things they do, I think, is bring the reader, they, they feel they're generous. I feel they're like one side of a conversation. And the idea of a collection, um, you know, I didn't expect it to do what it did. I wanted to write a collection, but I didn't know that once it was assembled, and that was basically me and a dear friend of mine on a, at a kitchen table, kind of swearing and trying to work out whether it went in the group. It took ages. Um, once they were assembled, they started to talk to one another. It was very strange, and the same themes kept coming, they kept reappearing, kept echoing through the collection. They were all about, as Drew you know, was pointing out, they're they a lot of about about national identity, about belonging, about borders, about. Um, fear and exclusion and love and hope and, and they all seem to sort of hover on these questions and all of those I think are causal for our historical moment and um, and essays are good too I mean I don't know about you but my my concentration span is shot these days I can barely get through a TV series like one episode without putting I don't want to do something else so I hope that they kind of fit these really grim times in a way that's comfortable for people. And Thank I think, you. You know, Helen, one of the things that, that's a great question. And one of the questions that I had, I, I struggle, I, I've fallen in love with, with the essay. And you said sort of this concentrated attention, Helen, and um, I'm not sure whether my publisher will be watching or not, but one of the arguments 
um, that you're having to make now, whether or not you have this narrative thread that somehow connects. And sometimes I think artificially so, and you can tell when it's an artificial thread that's just sort of there to make chapter mm -hmm. one to chapter two. Yeah. But I threads there as Helen talked about theme and I think we have to trust the reader thematically um, to feel what the writer intends so and I, I just think you did that so beautifully so I love being able to jump around in your book but I didn't right um, go back and I'll jump around the next time you saw I'll one of those things you can keep in the bathroom and read you know like I'm just going to do something because I'm getting um, I'm getting um, some bother, some static, as we say in London, from a certain creature over here. So I'm going to bring that. <laughs> um, this is my 17 year old small parrot, Paul Gordul, who's going to sit and sit with us while we. I hope that's Look okay. That. That's wonderful. We need to have him on the crowdcast uh, every time. Um, Drew, actually, we have a question for you since you were talking about okay. your editor and your publisher. Um, are you working on a book now? Uh, Susan Crivoy uh, said that she enjoyed your memoir very much. I'm sure she's not the only one. Thank you very much. Yes, I am. I am working on uh, the next book. It's called Right Now Tentatively Range Maps, Birds, Blackness, and Loving Nature Between the Two. So um, I call it eco psycho -social treatment of ornithology and um, so taking birds and and knowing not just what birds are but who birds are as Berdul is um, I mean it's you know this whole idea of, of the culture that we've infused into birds and how we feel about birds like starlings or um, loggerhead shrikes that weren't because they were seen as as being injurious to other birds. But then beyond that, how that filters, especially for me as a, as a Southern black man into, into culture yeah. and how it's impacted really. You heard Helen talk about songbird protection really began as this way to sort of push on immigration. And it's an uncanny story, an unfortunate story that's happened a lot. So um, the pub date for that, um, is 2020 was is 2021 but working hard on it um daily with a deadline approaching october 15 for <laughs> for well, a portion of the i can't wait i can't wait to read that oh my goodness i'm gonna nag you to send me a copy before you go i really would love to so excited count on it i will count on it and we'd love to have you back at book fair miami book fair on books and books when that when that book does come out so you have Just a standing like invitation, it. Drew. Um, we Thank have a, another question from June Frost. And uh, since we just had our friend, uh, your birdie, up on the screen, this is a, a perfect question, maybe for, for your bird, actually. Um, but it is, I would like to know if there's a bird nature, the same as human nature, and if it all um, involves being programmed. Oh, I'm not the right person to answer this. Uh, I think Drew is much more scientifically kind of uh, qualified. Um, yeah, we, we, we're, all, we're all programmed to a certain extent, but we're all individuals. I mean, you know, uh, I, I, you know I, I think, of, uh, think of a bird building a nest. So, for example, a bird building a nest, it's going to build a nest like other birds of that species, but every nest is going to be unique because it's going to, it's going to involve the personality of that particular bird, the materials it can find, the kind of place that it's building it, you know. Um, I think that we are very ready to assume that animals, or have been very ready to assume that animals um, don't have personalities, that they are just kind of these like robots. And, um, you know, even a cursory glance at, at, at uh, the reality of, of, of living organisms, you know, particularly with me, I mean, having kept a lot of animals, you know, they, as you know, with dogs, you know, they have personalities, you know. It's all, it's nature and nurture, both those things. Um, what do you think, Birdle? He's not going to answer, he can only say hello. I mean, it's not going to be very, very <laughs> response. Um, but um, it is interesting, I, I, with this bird, you know, I've taught him one English word, but he's taught me an enormous number of vocalizations that have come somehow in between human whistles and bird noises. So we have the lingua franca that we've developed over the years that we understand each other perfectly but it's it's a kind of hybrid human non-human language 
So I think we, you know, we're all adaptable and we, we can all shift and change. Uh, maybe not tardigrades and maneuvers, but certainly, you know, most animals. Drew, sorry, I'm wish we're on. I, I, I feel amoeboid these days, I'll be honest. <laughs> I, you know, I spot on, Helen, I, I think in that the example of Bertle and, and the language and sort of this blurring that we're seeing science, science is teaching us more of what we don't know as opposed, I think, to giving us all the answers. So, um, you know, the traditional um, behavioral school of thinking about things being hardwired and, and animals being, as Helen said, robots of instinct, um, that, that begins to break down um, the more that, that we observe, but then also looking through different prisms. And, and we make assumptions about animals all the time because it fits us and it fits our comfort zone. And if nothing else, this quarantine um, should be teaching us the quarantine, the, the unrest um, of social injustice is, is hopefully teaching us to find some, not comfort, but place and discomfort so that we can respond in more adaptive ways. Yeah. Ellen talks about the apocalypse being around us and she does a beautiful job of saying, as my grandmother used to talk about, I was just afraid at any moment I was going to be jerked up naked into the sky and, or sent to hell um, in the rapture. But that what occurs around us, we have to adapt to. Um, and so I think that goes for the other beings on this planet that we share this rock with, that, that we're learning as we go along, really. Yeah. Beautifully that Helen knows how that she communicates with her feathered companion in this way that no one else understands. It's an amazing thing. It's true. I am the crazy cat lady. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Drew. That, that was really quite beautiful the way you answered that. And I think you're right. Adapting is really the most important thing for all of us right now. Um, and we have a couple of questions or related uh, questions about sea turtles in Florida. This is from Doug, who works with sea turtles on the Gulf Coast of Florida. And uh, Drew, you, he, um, Doug is telling us, you said cuteness is a field mark. And in that vein, um, here in Florida, we're getting overwhelmed with beach goers loving our turtles to death. Any suggestions on how to encourage your enthusiasm, but in a caring way, and Vicky is, um, you know, also in a related uh, comment, she says, and conversely, the not so cute species and communicating their importance. Yeah, I mean, who can resist baby sea turtles, right? Until you understand that, you know, your intrusion um, is a dead stop literally on cuteness. So, you know, that I, I think is a part of, the, the difficulty of conservation because so much of it is depended upon this link to charismatic megafauna, to, to large attractive things that people want to touch. And that for years we've spent our, our there have been a what, two generations of people who have seen television programs where people are chasing cute things and hoping them yeah. wild. And so that, that, that makes a difference, I think, in, in how we've learned. Mm. And that to stand back and watch from afar. And I always think about people who handle snakes, especially, um, that they may see as cute, but you know, in, in many of our limbic sort of systems, snakes give us pause for just a moment to say, oh, will you bite me? Are you venomous? Or can I let you go on your way and my on mine? And somewhere we sort of cross the line where we, we need to pick them up. Right. Um, so I think part of the education and helping people understand just how hard it is to hatch from that leathery egg that your chances have already been compromised by climate change, by development, by these different title systems. And then once you're up, you know, there's some help that maybe you need in getting into that surf. Being held is not one of them. So. Yeah getting at kids and helping understanding that, you know, yeah, cute is a field mark, but let's see it from afar, um, I think is important. For those, for those things that, you know, that beauty in the eye of the beholder, um, 
it's it's quite the curious thing. I mean, there's some things that even I, um, you know, I a spider on my neck always makes me sort of shiver, right? Um, but I understand I'm in that spider's place many times. So I think it's a matter of understanding place and also divorcing yourself of a little bit of ego. Absolutely. Um, both of those, that last, I mean, all that and those, that last two, two observations about ego and place, I think are very important. I mean, one of, the, one of my pet hates are uh, YouTube funny videos about animals. Um, I, love, I, love, I love the internet. I, you know, I'm a real devotee of ridiculous memes. But so many of the images of animals doing funny or cute things were showing animals in extreme distress. And, um, you know, owls being kind of, you know, stroked and you can see them kind of like, you know, and it's not fine. Yeah. Um, so I think I'd love to just see a little bit more attention paid in, I mean, this is a real pipe dream, but in education, because I'm thinking about like reading animals' body language, what animals are really like, they're not like us. I think just even a very small amount of education like that would be helpful. Um, and also, like, my book talks a little bit about this, how I have, spent years expecting animals to be right in front of my face through binoculars like they are in field guides and I slowly began to see that there's something extremely precious about seeing animals at a distance or in in tracks between trees or in yes. of rooms. because what that does is magical it keeps the landscape the habitat and the creature together into one thing and the more animal sightings that you have like that the more you realize that the animal is part of where it lives it's not something that's like in a museum display. So that for me is a very powerful weapon against the need to pull it out where it is and what it is, pull it out and look at it closely. It's, it's uh, you know, photography is also, I think, at fault with that. You know, we, there's just a sense that it needs to be right here. So, um, but it's a tricky one. Baby turtles are really cute. I get it. Yeah. Golden Orioles, yeah. right? The bits and pieces. So for me, it was morning war. It was well, Connecticut warbler. I've never seen a whole Connecticut warbler. <laughs> pieces of it. I don't think it exists as a whole bird. So I think it's pieces in trees. <laughs> right. really, your neck is killing you because you've been staring up. <laughs> this is wonderful. Um, we have a few questions that are all related to to the craft of writing uh, your books, and these are uh, addressed to both of you. So I'm going to. Um, wrap all the questions up into like one big question that will get us, um, will get you, you guys talking about your influences. So, um, nature writing influence or, uh, influence or, or inspirations, uh, that you, uh, have, you know, over the years that have led you to write the kinds of books you're writing. Um, what have you learned? And I think, um, you touched on this earlier as part of your conversation, but, you know, what have you learned from each other? Um, you know, when it comes to writing, since, um, you know, you have such a great camarad uh, camaraderie, that's uh, my Cuban accent there coming through. And um, the last one is, what uh, kinds of writing, specifically poetry, how's that affected your nature writing style in terms of lyricism, word choice, mouthfeel, cadence? And this last question is from Celeste Shan. Um, so yeah, influences, what kind of poetry or if poetry has affected um, the way you write and what have you learned from each other? Uh, okay, do you want to go first, Drew, or should I go first? What? Please, Helen, please. Uh, okay, so um, lots of nature writers have influenced me, like loads. Um, most of them are very well known, um, you know, talk about Barry, Barry Lopez, um, for example. There's an essay he wrote on a stone horse. Um, a picture, a pictograph, pictograph in, in the desert, the southwest desert. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This amazing meditation about how you need to know the names to talk about the world, and that's become a, a really important thing in terms of my own attitude towards being accurate. And, and you know, nature is not just this green blur. You need to know the names to know what's there and what's missing. So that's really important. Um, but there are lots and lots of writers. There are women and there are uh, people of color. And there are, but the one voice that is not very well known in America that I would really like to pick up, and it's a nature writer called R. F. Langley, Roger Langley. He was an astonishing poet, but he also wrote a series of journals um, about the natural world that, to me, are some of the finest work about paying attention. And they're not just paying attention. And describing what he saw, but there are also, you know, he'll, he'll look at an insect crossing a railway bridge and suddenly it will become a disquisition on time and purpose in human life. 
and the bravery of that, the bravery of taking these little, little moments in the natural world and opening them up like a kind of, I don't know, like a like a sort of mass problem into everything. I, I found, I find always exciting. And um, so journals by RF Lang. Um, in terms of what is and what isn't allowed in nature writing, everything's allowed in nature writing. You can have everything, you can have sex, you can have swearing, you can have a history of tank. <laughs> nature writing, as we know, is, you know, you, you have this sort of sense, it's a bit like nature art. You're not supposed to have anything human in it. It's supposed to be this weird, imaginary place where everything's pristine but i just feel very strongly if there's a nightingale singing by a you know by a burned out car you put the car in you have to honor the reality of the world and um one of the reasons this book you know drew's book is just blew me away is the way that you put together family and history and, and and lived experience um in wild places in a way that was really 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 inspiring and as for poetry um yeah, yeah, no, I used to be a poet and I love playing with words and I am quite pleased with the way. Like, for example, that 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 essay um, about living on a farm and chasing a herd of steers up a hill, you know, if, yeah. if you really are obnoxious, you probably, you know, you know your literature, you'll know there's quite a few quotes from Dante in that, that <laughs> there are bits from, from um, Purgatory, you know, I put a bit of dancing in there. So, so like it's, it, it's all running through me all the time. I mean, I always, always get my poetry in there, even if it's hidden. Mm. I, the blackbird on well, the. You know, um, for me, well, first there was the B volume of Compton's Encyclopedia, um, but I, I spent a lot of time in Aesop's Fables, which I, the more I think about it the more I think had some influence on me. But as um, one of the first books, series of books that I read as a kid and hardly anybody knows Sally Carragher, who wrote um, one day on Beetle Rock and one day at Teton Marsh. And it's, and I, I earlier I'd sort of dismissed the narrative thread. Well, not dismissed it, but talked about the importance of essay. But in that, in these books, Sally Carragher would weave together these stories where the trout is rising to the fly, to the mayfly, but then there's the bear waiting on the shoreline, and then there's the crow that's watching the bear, and um, and they were just beautiful. And I would lose myself in these books, and then I would try to recreate these scenes in a peat box. So I'd get a shoe box, and I would recreate those. So um, I'd be able to create these worlds um, through the writer. Sally Carragher, um, later on, of course, Aldo Leopold and that lyricism of observation was yeah. critical. For me. Um, I, you know, and, and that still for this, this scientist and this transformation in his life, this evolution of thought that allowed him to, to, to reach that sort of philosoph state um, was important mm. to me. Um, You know, recently, I, so having talked about sort of earworms in one of the chapters and sort of songs that got in her brain, and I will admit, and and um, he has a, a little bit of a, sort of a different, different rep reputation, but D.H. Lawrence wrote a, a poem, Wales Weep Not, and fell in love with Wales Weep Not not from reading D.H. Lawrence, but hearing Leonard Nimoy recite it with a winter consort. And it was, it, it blows me away. Um, and, and so the sort of Lawrence getting the wells right, but also sort of this, this a little bit of the timber of, um, of, of wailing without these whales ever, ever dying. Um, so you know, my friends and I, talk a lot about sort of who has influenced us. And outside of nature writing for me, um, you know, I, I, I think about, I think about Baldwin, right? And Baldwin's and, and, and being really out there about who he is and identity, but also with the stressors of that. Um, I take, from Terry Tempest Williams and um, and sort of her personal journey 
and um, and Helen has blown me away. I, um, I, I will admit to having stalked two writers in my life. One was Janice Ray with a college of a cracker childhood. I had to hear her read her words. Mm. And then when I found Helen was going to be at Middlebury and teaching bread loaf. And I got an offer from Megan Mayhew Bergman to teach there that sealed it for me because I wanted to, I wanted to learn and um, hearing her read her words um, that helps me learn as a writer. And so knowing that she's also a poet and that that lyricism and the mouth feel and the rhythm um, builds in and you can feel that in her writing that you can't feel in a lot of nature writing. So I'm very much appreciative of that. So I, I tell my friends all the time that, um, you know, that I had this opportunity to learn alongside a great writer as I was teaching. And I think um, it's one of the biggest gifts of, of my writing career. So I'm, I'm grateful. Oh my goodness. Well, I am not only squirming like a slug with salt poured on it with that extraordinary phrase group, but I just want to let you know that you do realize that I only went to that event because I knew you were going to be there. <laughs> well, not only, but that was a very big draw. So thank you for being It was. This has been really fun. Thank you so much, people. It is. It is. <laughs> It has indeed been um, fun, and and I've learned so much. I've been making notes of all the uh, nature writers that you are recommending. Uh, so if anyone out in the audience uh, later on is, uh, is trying to remember some of those titles, feel free to uh, email us at Books and Books or Mummy Book Fair, and I'll send that list out to you. Uh, but we have um, one last question and a surprise. Um, the folks who know me in the audience know that I'm a tattoo enthusiast. <laughs> And right before we went on camera, Helen shared her, her new beautiful tattoo. Um, so you're going to show it to us and, and tell us what it is? Yeah, but I've never had a tattoo. And I decided if you're going to go, if you're going to do it, you go big, right? So go I've, big or go home. I've got a six-winged seraph, despite my, you know, irreligious heart uh, on, my, on, my, on my arm. He's uh, really good. It's really great. I love him so wow. much. He's so great. And I, I was so really beautiful. I was worried that the parrot would be like, and he's just completely ignored it. He clearly thinks it's part of me now. <laughs> so <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. And our last question from the audience before we sign off, and thank you both so much for uh, being with us today. Um, can you tell us, Helen, how did you arrive at the title Vesper Flight? Um, it's it's a it's a it's a term and it's a term that is used for these uh, dawn and dusk ascents of the um, common swift, arpus arpus, which means footless because their feet are so tiny they don't even they can barely walk on them, or they can't walk on them. So these birds are the ones that drop into the sky to, to work out where they are. And I, I've always thought that vessel flights um, is the most beautiful phrase. It um, it comes from the Latin Vesper, meaning evening, and it's also the last um, prayers of the day in, um, you know, some mm -hmm. Christian traditions. And um, it kind of caught what the book was trying to do. It's like we, it, you know, we're living at a time, it, it feels like we're in the evening of the world, right? It feels like we're coming towards darkness, or it's coming towards us, it's rolling towards us very, very, very fast. So the idea that we might take flight in the evening and try and work out what to do next became very important to me, and that's really why that title uh, is what it is. It's a lot easier to explain than H's for Hawk, which is impossible to explain. <laughs> That's really hard. <laughs> so, um, no, it's a great question. No one's asked that before, so thank you for it. Well, thank you. And thank you, Drew. And thank you again, Helen. And thank you to um, all our friends at Grove Publishing who uh, have put this book out at your last. Um, there's a number of other books. Um, um, your poetry books, all available for sale on the booksonbooks.com site. Uh, Drew's book also, I've dropped the links on the chat yeah. for you all. And, um, you know, we're just so grateful that you are all here today with us on this afternoon, Friday, uh, on Sunday. And um, everyone who joined us, thank you again. And uh, we hope to see the audience at another one of our events soon. And we hope to see both of you um, there's a, uh, you're on tour, on virtual book tour, Helen. And if everyone, if anyone else wants to catch you again, um, there's a list of events available at Grove, uh, Grove's uh, website page. 
So thank you all for coming and we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Helen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.